Welcome to the Arlington Street Church podcast. Founded in 1729, Arlington Street continues today as a gathering place for progressive people of faith in the greater Boston area and beyond. We are located at the corner of Arlington and Boylston Streets, across from the Public Garden in Boston, Massachusetts. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace. The sound echoed off the wall as if it were haunting me. Empty walls, empty room, and this loud whisper. It was the sound of the breast pump. As I was producing milk for my daughter Layden, my body physically reminding me that I was not done being a mother. As I sat in the dark room by myself on the hardwood floor, looking around at Layden's things, wondering how I had gotten here, how I was going to move forward. My eyes landed on the collection of books I had bought for her throughout my pregnancy. Each week, I bought Layden a new book. Didn't know if Layden was gonna enter this world as a boy or a girl, so it was just referred to as Dear Baby. And in the book I reached for, I wrote, Dear Baby, your mom and dad love you so much already. We have family all over the country. Massachusetts, Florida, California, Indiana, North Carolina, New Jersey, Delaware, and even more. We believe an invisible string of love keeps us all connected. Hugs and kisses, mom and dad. As I closed that book titled The Invisible String, I wondered where my daughter Layden was. At the age of four months, she had lost her life in a case termed in a catastrophe at Boston Children's Hospital. And I sat here in my pain, my sorrow, my grief, uncertain of how I was going to move forward. And the truth is in grief, it's a balancing act. And I have spent my last six years dedicated to understanding grief, loss, and all of the energies that surround these collective experiences. Because I found really quickly in my grief journey that I wasn't alone, right? When fight or flight kicks in, I am fight. I traveled outside of the country by myself to see world-renowned grief speaker, Dr. Raymond Moody, to hear him talk about life after life, to hear him talk about grief, to hear him talk about near-death experiences. I just wanted an answer a solution. Tell me what to do and I will do it. I thought I just need to get out of this pain, this discomfort. I need to know how I will move forward. But it was right down the road here in Newton, Massachusetts, where I sat in my grief coach's office that the words I still hear her saying ring true. She said, Melissa, you can do this and you can do that and you can travel here. You can fight it all you want. But the truth is sometimes you just have to sit with the shit. An answer I didn't like, but how often is it that the things we resist are exactly where our growth lies? And so I did, I made space, I allowed it to come up. I studied it, I sought to understand it, I honored it. And in doing so, I discovered a couple of things. One, it is a balance of allowing grief to surface, but it is a choice and an action to decide and determine how we navigate through. Another truth that I discovered was that grief is universal. I am not alone in having a what do I do now moment. How do I move forward? 
It can look different for everyone. It might be in the loss of a job, could be in the loss of a loved one, the loss of a future imagined or envisioned, the loss of a relationship, maybe the end or the detaching from truths that we knew to be ours that kept us feeling safe, maybe a loss of a sense of identity. Loss exists throughout our lives. So rather than running from it, how do we move forward in these what do I do now moments? In grief, we don't suddenly develop any new tools or change our ways of coping with things. In fact, what grief does is it ultimately takes everything up to the surface. It holds a magnifying glass, right, to the intense feelings that we might have stored. And in order to navigate through, to sit with it, we've got to use some tools, right? And these tools that I'm sharing with you today are ones that have supported me and so many others in the past years. And they are so important right now because our world is collectively grieving. Many of us losing attachment to what our life was supposed to look like during this time being forced into quarantine, forced indoors, not able to hug or connect to the people that we love. In fact, knowing that keeping distance from the very people that make us feel love and connection was the safe and loving thing to do. Many people have suffered in their jobs and in their industries, wondering how do I move forward? And we are collectively grieving the loss of George Floyd and so many others. I personally found myself thinking, how does Mrs. Floyd move forward? For me, I found solace and comfort in knowing that despite Layden's case being termed a catastrophe, people had done the best they could do. Mrs. Floyd is deprived of that comfort, right, of that knowingness that people did the best they could do. So as our world grieves in different ways, unfortunately, it is our choice and our responsibility to enlist and to create and to cultivate the tools to move forward. And this isn't easy. This isn't something that I welcomed or wanted. In fact, I felt like I just lost my daughter. Now I have to take responsibility for my grief. I have to take responsibility for how I move forward. It was just one of the many lessons lying within loss. So how do we move forward? And I'll share a few strategies that I have found to be incredibly helpful for myself and for others. And the very first time I spoke, spoke here in the pulpit was six years ago this weekend. I always like to speak on this weekend when I have the opportunity to, because it was the first time I spoke, it was Layden's memorial service. I shared the story of her life, her fight, and her light. I didn't think I would speak again, but Layden continues to teach. And I will say, despite where you are on your grief journey and your grief processing, some of these may resonate with you, not all of them, maybe all of them. But the most important thing we can do right, is return to our very basic principles of Unitarian Universalists and embrace this time with an open mind, right, an open heart and an open hand. As we navigate this grief, this world, these challenges, whatever it is, we must do so with compassion for ourselves, right? We have to make space for it. It's this balance, this dance of making space for it and moving through it, right? So as we get through these what do I do now moments, we must lead with compassion because if we beat ourselves up, if we shame ourselves, if we blame ourselves, if we point fingers, we are literally adding weight to something that is already so heavy. Gratitude, compassion, trust, faith, openness. These are the energies we want to reach for as best as we can in these vulnerable 
and impactful moments. We have to detach from what it was supposed to be. Lean on our faith and trust the process of navigating through. In fact, many times we have to let go of knowing what it's going to look like. As we go through that darkness, we don't know. And it's allowance of that that's going to allow us to move forward. Now, I really, really do well with tangible strategies. In addition to my faith and energy, I like to have real tools. So if you are like me, these will help you. And one of the most helpful tools I learned was building our world. See, oftentimes we wait for things to get better before we feel better. Or we think that our grief, our loss, our heartache, our trauma is suddenly going to get smaller. Or we cross that one year invisible finish line and we're suddenly cured. The truth is there is no finish line. We've been rerouted. We've been detoured but there is no finish line. So what we do is we learn to build our world so that if grief is taking up your entire world, we don't wait for grief or pain to take up less. We begin to expand your world, right? To make it bigger. So the percentage that it gets lessens. Now, this needs to be done strategically and individually because what one person is ready for is going to be different than another person. For me, at first, I needed to expand my world in places that knew my daughter Layden, where I wouldn't have to explain my story. Right? It was here at Arlington Street Church. It was at the Boston Children's Hospital Parent Group. It was in the Boston Children's Hospital Marathon Team. I started by expanding in places that felt safe. Eventually, I was joining run clubs where nobody knew Leiden. And eventually, I would tell them about Leiden. I joined other professional development clubs. You can learn new hobbies. I've worked with people who have taken retreats, right? Who have maybe taken up a new language, read books or podcasts. But they've immersed themselves into something new that's going to expand their world. They've taken action through it. The next thing is understanding teammates, right? This is a concept that is hard because we want people that we love to be able to support us in all the different ways that we need support, right? And there are really in grief, there are four types of teammates. You have listeners, you have doers, you have distractors, and you have what my grief coach called the Xers. She wanted to keep it PG, but she later explained to me that the Xers was crossing out a not so great word, Melissa, that begins with an F. Now, the thing is, is that all of these people have room in your life to help you as you're going through this. But what we don't want is to add unnecessary frustration by becoming upset with somebody because they are more of a doer, but they are not a listener. A lot of people think they are a listener, but listening actually requires being able to hear and receive and sit in the heavy without interjecting what we think someone should do, when it will get better, how they should navigate it, or using those words at least. Listening is actually, in my opinion, one of the hardest roles to fill on a teammate because we do not like to be in discomfort and we do not like the people we love to be in discomfort. Our human reaction is to try to remove it. So as you look at your teammates, who are your doers? Who are the people that will help tackle that to-do list, the next project, plan something? These were the people that helped me plan Layden's memorial service, do fundraising for Boston Children's Hospital. Who are your listeners? Who are the people that you can call or be with and cry? that will just allow you to sit in the heavy without trying to minimize it for you? Who are the distractors, the people that perhaps don't do well in this uncomfortable, but if you wanna to go to a movie or go for a hike, if you wanna have dinner or go for a walk and distract yourself from the pain, they are there. Right? And who are the Xers? Right? Tend to be the people who insert themselves in because they like the drama and the chaos. 
Now, them, those, these people you actually can use strategically by letting them know anything you want the outer world to know. If you're not ready to talk to the outer world, you can let them talk for you. Be very strategic here. Now, when we become the coach of our own team, what we're doing is we're first becoming aware of what we need. What do I need in this moment? And who can help me access it? Right? We are moving away from codependency, where we expect someone to completely carry us. Now, I know it doesn't feel fair because when we are grieving, when we are hurting, when we are pained, we don't want to carry anymore. But I'm here to tell you and to show you, you can do it. You can carry it. And in fact, when you are looking to the listener to be a listener and they feel good because they're helping you in a way that's authentic to them, and you're not frustrated that they're not meeting your needs and you're looking to the doers to help you do things and not becoming frustrated because they're not listening, it lightens the load. It's like that investment of awareness will lighten your load. Now, just like your teammates will support you authentically, it is important that you authentically grieve. Now, remember, we are defining grief way beyond the loss of a life, okay? the loss of that future you envisioned, that job, that relationship, your identity, the loss of understanding the world to be as we knew it to be. Now, when we authentically grieve, we're allowing the way that we traditionally cope with things to surface. We're allowing that to come up to the top. If you're not a writer, you're likely not going to suddenly pick up writing. If you've never meditated, meditating is not going to feel effective. Now you can begin to cultivate these new schools skills as you build your world, right? You will cultivate them as you build your world, but it's not going to be your default. And it's important to remember that because other people will tell you what you should do to feel better. You need to think of what works for you. Is it art? Is it music? Is it cooking? Is it being around other people? Is it taking alone time? When Leighton was born, I was nicknamed Mama Razzi. I have more pictures of my daughter Layton from her short four months here than I think my mom might have of me in my you know, 36 years. And I don't think that that's a reflection of my mom not taking a lot of pictures. It really speaks more loudly to the amount of documentation I had of Layton's short life. And that was my nickname, Mama Razzi. So it was not surprising that after her death, I found comfort in her pictures and her things and being connected to her through what's called linking objects. So it was no surprise that on Dia de los Muertes here at Arlington Street Church, when Reverend Kim told me I could bring as many pictures as I wanted, that not only did I bring poster boards full of pictures, I brought poster size pictures of little Layden's face. But for me to have space to authentically grieve and to feel as though I were mothering in the way that I knew how to mother was a gift. You know, one of my coaches, greatest mentors, all throughout high school, I had the privilege to go back and coach with him upon graduating from college. He was the head coach, I was the assistant. And he said to me, when I asked for feedback on how was I doing, he said, Melissa, you gotta stop trying to be me. I'm a middle-aged, Italian, sarcastic guy. You're not me. You have to be you, right? So I think of that all the time when I think of how do I need to authentically grieve? What do I need in this moment? And how can I authentically access it? And then less tangible but so important is we lean into our faith, right? As we're navigating through the darkness, as we're unsure of if a finish line even exists. Right? I wish I was the bearer of better news in this, right? This is something that I wanted to find a finish line. I wish I was here telling you, once you do all these things, you get through it. But the truth is, we wouldn't want a finish line because this is a part of the process of strengthening, of growing, of evolving, of learning, and of sharing. And so as we make space for it, we lean into our faith, my faith has grown tremendously since losing my daughter. It took some time, but I leaned in here to our community, to our family, 
And so during these times in our world, when we're collectively grieving the loss of George Floyd and so many others, when we're collectively grieving the life we envisioned by many of us being forced into isolation, right, with the health threats of COVID, when we're collectively grieving whatever else it is that we're carrying, this is the time to lean in to our community. Beloved spiritual companions, it's a process. When I returned to Arlington Street, I sat up above by myself, far from anyone, oftentimes with my computer where I wrote. I slowly made my way down and eventually found my way to the pulpit as a member of the worship committee. It's a process. You can become okay again without your situation becoming okay. Rather than waiting for it to magically get better or to find that finish line or to get over it, we learn together how to navigate and strengthen forward in the chaos, in the trauma, in the heartache. We lean on our teammates, we build our world, and we show up authentically. We find the beauty of all of these aspects of the experience that is that of the human. And we hang on to that invisible string, that invisible string of love that keeps us all connected. Hugs and kisses, trust the process, amen. Okay. This morning's benediction is the words of Michelle Obama. Instead of letting your hardships and failures discourage or exhaust you, let them inspire you. Let them make you even hungrier. Do not view your challenges as a disadvantage. Understand that your experience facing and overcoming adversity is actually one of your biggest advantages. There's power in allowing yourself to be known and heard in owning your unique story in using your authentic voice. Do not underestimate the importance you can have because history has shown us that courage can be contagious and hope can take on life of its own. The service begins when the service ends. Bless your hearts, amen. Where you go, where you go, I will go, beloved. Where you go, I will go. Where you go, I will go, beloved. Where you go, I will go. For your people are my people. Your people are mine. Your people are my people. Your divine, my divine. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace.